Okay, so I'm joined by Dr. Uh, Jim Stewart, Senior Lecturer in Finance at Trinity College. And in this global recession slash depression, you've noted in particular to the collapse of Bear Stearns in 2007, the lack of attention given to the role of tax havens. So yep. why do you think the media haven't focused on the role of tax havens? Well, it's not just the media. I think regulators generally did not focus much on tax havens in the global financial crisis. Uh, and in fact, the role of tax havens generally in the economy are given not a lot of attention. Tax havens in terms of avoiding tax or evading tax, that gets some attention okay. But the economic effect of tax havens has been ignored generally by the media, regulators, uh, policy makers, etc. Because a lot is made about Ireland's corporate tax rate and we're constantly told that it's 12.5%, but the effective corporate tax rate is a lot lower. Oh, far, far lower than that, but that's true of all, all countries. There's a big gap between what might be called the nominal tax rate, the tax rate in, in law, and the effective tax rate. Now, there, are, there are difficulties in measuring the effective tax rate, so one way of thinking about it is the actual check you hand over to the revenue every year. And that can vary from period to period depending on tax allowances and whether you have losses and all of that sort of stuff. But in general, I would say for most companies in Ireland, the effective tax rate is far below the nominal tax rate. And in fact, uh, revenue statistics data show that uh, a majority of companies have uh, taxable profits of less than 25,000 per annum. So effectively, a lot of companies have no taxable profits. Mm. So they don't pay any tax at all because of no taxable profits. Now that might be for most of them indigenous firms they're probably because they're making losses they're not making enough money to to to, to pay tax when you consider that they can have, have they can deduct various uh, legitimate tax allowances uh, you know running in running the business uh, there are also some multinational companies that would have very low rates of tax and some of them zero but the the tax rate for u.s multinational companies for example one measure it's around four uh, percent and that's for 2008 and they can by taxing profits they can sort of there's very low tra transfer pricing rules in Ireland so sort of bookkeeping and accounting accountancy skills you can sort of not report your profits you know you can transfer your profits to another subsidiary well, well no the, the low tax rate would mean you have an incentive to transfer profits to Ireland uh, so you, you use transfer pricing uh, to transfer profits to the lowest tax regime but in addition, there are various other tax allowances that companies can claim, and particularly multinational companies can claim to reduce their effective tax rate to far below uh, the nominal tax rate of 12.5%. Uh, the, the effective tax rate is far lower in other countries as well. For example, in the Netherlands, uh, one measure of taxable profits is even below the Irish tax rate. Uh, the Netherlands, it may surprise, surprise many people, is to all intents and purposes a tax haven. Now, many countries have features of a tax haven, uh, and Ireland has had many of these features, but so is the Netherlands, so is the UK in various aspects of their tax code. And you've um, noted the role of treasury management firms. Right. You've um, provided analysis of 41 yes. firms that have made their accounting data available. Right. Would you like to go through some of them? Well, I was, I was interested in uh, treasury management firms because they were very large and also from some uh, some ideas, some some examples I've looked at, they had either no or or, or very low employment. So I managed to get a, a sample of forty one of these, identify these for a time series. And treasury management firms are firms that uh, operate the they control the cash balances within the multinational firm. So every multinational firm would have a treasury management firm, and uh, they can organise. Uh, debt payments, debt repayments, uh, raise debt for the multinational company. So the main conduit by which financial flows take place uh, via in, within a multinational company. Now this is complex because a multinational company wants to make sure that it transfers funds from one subsidiary to the parent or within the firm. It doesn't trigger a tax charge. So if you have no tax, if you paid no tax on your 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 profits quite legitimately through operating a tax haven or for whatever reason, 
you want to make sure when their their profits are repatriated you don't trigger any tax charge and and um, treasury management firms are instrumental in in operating on that but more generally in a in a, a uh, the eurozone area it makes sense to have a single entity that would manage all uh, debt and cash balances within the banking system so you minimize all of those so, so multinational com uh, trans uh, treasury management firms are, are very interesting for, for for that reason they're also huge very very large indeed and their flows have a considerable effect on the big numbers uh, the big numbers uh, meaning the balance of payments uh, inflows and outflows uh, current account capital account so I was interested in these, these firms and in fact the median employment for these firms is actually zero. They, they employ no people, but they're very large indeed. The median assets was around 500 million yeah, uh, yeah. US 643 dollars. 643 million. Yeah, yeah, over 500 million. But uh, their accounts are, all, are generally in US dollars. Yeah. So yeah. what do these uh, treasury management firms offer Ireland? Well, because you, you have to remember that the tax rate on trading profits is 12.5% in Ireland but the tax rate on non-trading profits is 25%. So none of them pay tax anything like 25%, but they do pay some tax. So the IFSC, I can't remember the precise proportion, but it accounts for a substantial proportion of total corporate tax payments within Ireland. So Ireland gets a little bit of tax revenue out of them, uh, and there are some employees, and there would be accounting services that they, they would legal services that they would also use as well. So it creates some employment in other firms using their services. Yeah, yeah. And um, are you aware of the world? Are you aware of the world derivative market? Because some people have put it at one point two quadrillion dollars. Yes. Well, they others have it as high as one point five. Like nobody really knows. Right. Well, there there are a lot of derivatives, and uh, and financial instruments which which are are based on derivatives, based on real assets that are traded. There there are a lot of fund management companies that have various kinds of assets in their portfolio. Uh, so so the the whole issue about financial derivatives is really part of the complex of financial instruments that have developed in recent years. There's been a huge amount of financial innovation, and a lot of this financial innovation, a lot of these this, these. Uh, entities would be located in places like the IFSC and also Luxembourg is, a, is a, another location for these. So they would locate in Ireland because, historically, because of relatively light taxation, low corporate tax rates, and uh, ease of incorporation. Ease of incorporation coupled with a tax regime that's very flexible in relation to multinational companies. Mm. So the, the annual finance bill and act often has various slightly obscure concessions or changes in tax rate, but that, that might be aimed at particular multinational company subsidiary or financial company or whatever. Mm. So Ireland and the IFSC is very attractive for these kind of companies. The, the amounts involved are absolutely huge. The IFSC flows into and out of, dominates the balance of payments uh, on the current account. The assets owned in the IFSC are uh, a multiple of GNP, I think it's about 12 and a half times GNP. A multiple of direct investments that would be the, the Googles, the Facebooks, uh, Microsoft, and others. So the, the companies in the IFSC are, are far larger in terms of assets than these companies. Now they also have very large liabilities, so so net assets would be quite low, but gross assets are very large indeed. This is like a black hole, pretty much. Uh, I'm but not the, sure that it described as a, as, a, as a black hole. I, I think there's not enough money in the world to ever pay this off yet. Debt well, is constantly being sucked into this derivative market. Well, I think it's it's not so much a black hole, but it just represents the huge growth in the value of financial assets and financial assets trading. Now, in particular, the um, the tax havens and low tax jurisdictions such as the IFSC and Luxembourg are quite implicated in the shadow banking system. So it was the way that banks like Lehman Brothers. Uh, Bear Stearns could locate subsidiaries at very high gearing indeed, yeah. and they could basically trade on on this high gearing, and for a while they were very profitable. But then when the crash came, they lost large amounts of money. So so that was that was because of the light touch regulation. It was basically 
uh, banking subsidiaries that were pretending not to be banks. Yeah. And one of the reasons why you might locate in the IFSC is, of course, that the, the funds could be located on, a, could be traded on a local stock market. So it quoted, but not traded. It's just the Dublin Stock Exchange. Yeah. And in relation to the high gearing, can, can we just, I think you, you mentioned, was it um, one of the German banks was 84 cents for every hundred dollars. That's right. That's yes. not even 1%. That's even 1%, very high indeed. So uh, are the, these banks are just creating this money out of thin air? Well, they're, they're not so much creating money, they're borrowing money, so they're very highly leveraged. So they borrow the funds to undertake trading in derivative assets and other kinds of trading. So they're, where do they borrow this money? They borrow this money in the intrabank market. That's a sh they borrowed short term and lent long term. They borrowed this, this money and they bought uh, instruments such as subprime loans and repackaged subprime prime loans. So when the value of those loans fell, they then had a shortfall. They then tried to borrow at the intrabank market and they couldn't because credit dried up. So the, so the collapse in these highly leveraged firms, it was a major factor in the financial crisis, the global financial crisis. And in particular, the German banks, some five or so German banks were very badly affected, all up with subsidies in the IFSC. Uh, the largest one was uh, was uh, a hypo bank through its subsidiary Depfa, which is located in the IFSC. Now, when it was in the IFSC, it was mostly an independent Irish registered company taken over by hypo, and then it ran into huge financial difficulties. So the overall bailout cost to the German taxpayer has been very large indeed. It was originally estimated at loans and and credit guarantees is 110 billion. Now they've revised this down to around 55 billion. Still very large indeed. They've also had to put several bit several billion in equity into Hypo, largely not exclusive, but largely as a result of its debt for operations. And will these derivatives ever be paid off? Like surely, the only way to pay them off is just to keep printing money. Well, if you take if you take um, and if we're talking about one and a half quadrillion yeah, dollars, that's hyperinflation. Yeah. Yeah, well, if you if you talk uh, like Lehman Brothers, so Lehman Brothers had huge derivatives, huge uh, as an asset, and it had huge borrowings, and it had also written derivatives, which is it sold to other other people. So the amounts involved were, were trillions, but the net amount was actually much lower than that. The problem with Lehman Brothers is that it's taken years to unwind those. So there are many financial firms that are owed money from the administrators of layman's and they won't get paid for some time. So trying to unravel that and the process of unraveling that is extremely destructive indeed. In the case of AIG, the insurance company, uh, the US uh, regulated authorities thought that the, 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 the uh, cost and the, the uh, dislocation that would, recover, that would occur from allowing it to fall would be too great. So they decided to rescue AIG. Now it's interesting, in the case of AIG, they'd written credit default swaps. So they were the issuer, they were the, uh, of these credit default swaps. Once the credit default swaps were called in, like an insurance and a loan, a credit default swap is like an insurance and a loan, they couldn't pay because they'd run out of cash uh, because they were borrowing in the intrabank market. And in addition, assets they held also had collapsed in value. So the Federal Reserve pumped money into AIG and the major beneficiaries were companies like Deutsche Bank that were the counterparties, so they bought insurance from AIG. And it's interesting, this is an interesting example because for some reason, which is very, very difficult to understand, but part of, part of, well, it's part of the madness of the current economic policies is that the ECB and other governments, in particular the ECB, have decided that no credit default swap should be paid on, should be paid out on, so it's kind of insurance. So in the Greek uh, renegotiating the, the value of Greek bonds, uh, one of the, the principal objectives is to ensure it does not cr trigger a credit default swap. So the issues of the credit default swap don't have to pay up. So even though bonds are being written down, they're trying to organise this on a voluntary basis, so it will not issue, it will not trigger a credit default swap, it will not trigger an event, so this insurance is called in. So that's 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 very interesting because the beneficiaries of that, of course, the people who have issued this insurance, that, that you have insurance from like house insurance, your house burns down, but you don't have to pay up because the state says, no, we'll intervene to ensure that doesn't happen. But it also, so this seems to be a complete waste of money, but it also protects the issues of the insurance and would likely to be firms like Goldman Sachs and other banks. Now, it's interesting in the case of uh, Hungarian, Hungarian um, uh, loans that there have been 
uh, credit default swaps which were called in by an Austrian bank called Erste Bank, E-R-S-T-E, and that really led to large losses. So it's very difficult to know who's issued these, who are the counterparties, and what are the effects. But one of the, one of the, the um, key policies uh, that's, that's driving the current kind of uh, uh, mad ideas about uh, uh, the, in the, within the Eurozone is that no credit default swap should actually be triggered. Very puzzling. Hmm. But ultimately, who is going to pay for these? Ultimately, uh, if a credit default swap, supposing uh, a bank such as Deutsche Bank has issued credit default swaps to another bank uh, which holds debt, credit default swap is like an insurance on this debt, the debt defaults, interest isn't paid, they then go along to Deutsche Bank and say, we want our money on this insurance contract. Well now, what, what, what would happen is, is that Deutsche Bank would have to pay up. But supposing Deutsche Bank didn't have enough money, supposing as in the case of the French banks, uh, didn't have, they didn't have enough money, then the state would probably end up paying. But it depends on the liabilities. It's also interesting that a lot of credit of all swaps are held by people who do not own debt. So it's like, it's like having me taking out a life insurance policy on somebody else's life. So I can, I can take out this, this insurance without having what's called an insurable interest. Now, at the same time, the, the amount of credit default swaps in issue is a small fraction of the total debt in issue, for example, in relation to Italy, even for Greece. Not all debt is covered by credit default swap. But it's likely to be a much more actively traded market than in the, the secondary market for government debt. Hmm. Warren Buffett uh, calls them weapons of mass financial destruction. Do you agree with that? Yes, there's no, there's no doubt about it that uh, one of the problems is that they're unregulated. The, the, they were assumed uh, to have a risk profile which is unconnected with other financial instruments. In fact, a lot of these instruments are very closely correlated together. So once, uh, one, once there's a, a default or a problem on one market, that very quickly spreads to other markets. Yeah. So they're unregulated. And what effectively what I'm saying there is that the people issuing these and purchasing these didn't understand the nature of the instruments being traded. Well, could you say that they did and they realised that the state would be there to back them up? I think, you, I think that's assuming a level of intelligence that they didn't possess. Uh, I, I, I think they really, they really didn't understand uh, what, what they were doing. Uh, and they may have assumed that the state would pick up they were too big to fail. And there were seven examples of that in, in relation to um, uh, a, a fund that collapsed in 2000 in New, in New York. So that, that involved a, a major, major um, intervention by the New York Fed. So that might have set a precedent for, for more recent interventions. So I think it might have been they thought about they were too big to fail, but I think it's more likely that they didn't understand the risk that they were, they were engaging in. For example, one of the problems in, in UBS is that they'd, they had all of these subprime loans that they were packaging and selling on. Uh, so that was one part of UBS was doing that. At the same time, a second part was buying these, what they're called warehousing them. A second part of UBS? Oh, UBS was buying them. So they made huge losses on these. So one part that was selling them, surely you should have thought, told the other part, look, yeah. these are so risky, don't touch them. But they, 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 they failed to do that. Yeah, uh, that's common that, practice in most of the big banks. It was common banks. practice in the, the big banks that they, 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 they not only sold them, but they also bought them themselves yeah. because the rate of return was, was quite high, because, presumably because they thought they wouldn't fail. Now, again, that would seem to support the idea that they didn't understand the risks, yeah. or else why would, they, why would they have done this? Yeah. So um, just, to, just to close then, you think that most, a lot of these are housed in the IFSC, like the IFSC is crucial? In the trade, of I think financial centres are, are crucial for for a lot of these these derivatives. Now it's important to note the role of the IFSC because it seems to me to be there's a, a sort of triangular relationship that uh, the IFSC seems to me to be very closely tied in with London, as indeed is is Luxembourg. So a lot of the decision making may be taking place in the financial centre, such as as London or New York. The entity is. Uh, located in a low tax regime, uh, financial centres such as the IFSC or Luxembourg. And then there also seems to be a connection with the tax haven. So it may be located 
in Ireland, but it's then owned in Bermuda. So profits mm. are to another tax haven. There seems to be this triangular relationship. And double it Irish, they call that, don't they? Well, that, that's the double Irish relates to, to actually, actually not so much to financial firms, it relates to the operations of companies that have a lot of intellectual property, such as Google, Facebook, um, uh, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, all of these kinds of sorts of, sorts of firms would avail of other kind of tax concessions because a big thing about those firms is their intellectual property uh, that, that they own and they have this located in a tax haven. Mm. Now it's interesting that you mentioned the connection between the, the City of London and the IFSC because I was always under the impression that the, the EU love to have the IFSC there for them because it opens up all these hedge funds and derivative markets to the euro. Uh, I think I think one part of the EU, like the Financial Services Directive, which, which talks about free trade and financial services, probably welcomes that. But at the same time, I think it creates huge regulatory problems and they're gradually waking up to that and trying to do something about regulating both the IFSC and Luxembourg. Uh, and other tax havens, but they're the two largest financial centres within within the EU. Now we have to remember that there are other tax havens as well, uh, Isle of Man, the Jersey Islands, and all that. There's there are major centres for the location of these firms as well. Uh, so there is some employment created by, by these, but they're mostly for like brass plate kind of kind of entities yeah. with huge financial flows attached to them. Yeah. All right, Jim. Thanks very okay, much for speaking to me.